Well, welcome to another recording. This is Marcia Sinatar, and what you're going to hear is an excerpt, only an excerpt of a much longer interview done by Sounds True, a recording company, and you can find them online, and also we'll put a link in the text below this offering. The recording is about 20 years old, and it's about the mentor's spirit. And I make the distinction in the interview between the mentor's spirit, which is a kind of archetypal energy of the values and vision, the character of the mentor with whom we don't need to be connected directly. We can be far away. We can read about the mentor's spirit in a book or see it on a film or hear their voice. All of that is enough to catch the energy, the archetypal destiny or or direction that that person is going and be energized by it ourselves and be awakened in some deep sense to our own vision, our own values. As I say, the excerpt that you're going to hear is just a little bit of a much longer offering, which we'll have eventually on my website. And I think one of the reasons that it holds up so well is because of the questions that are asked to me by the president of Sounds True, Tammy Simon. I'm very fond of Tammy, and I'm very impressed and respect her a great deal. And She's expanded her company over the years into something really special. So with that little introduction, I welcome you to another audio recording, and um, enjoy. The Mentor's Spirit with Marcia Sinatar. Now here's a third key. The Mentor's Spirit furthers leadership power. You know, one reason that young executives fail to cultivate the fullness of their leadership potential is that they lack caring, capable mentors. Oh, they have training programs, but mentoring has to do with the full, whole development the character and spiritual formation of the person. And individuals who are whole themselves have to be mentors. I mean, what good is it if you're sitting in a class and some lackluster, uncaring, or perhaps timid or robotic person, it's obvious that if you're in a class and someone's reading to you from a manual, that is not going to speak to your spirit. It's not going to lift you in the way I'm speaking about today. So we often hold these fictional ideas about mentoring, not realizing that from a distance impersonal mentors can seed the good that we hope to accomplish over the course of a lifetime. Such seeding is usually of a spiritual nature, an image, a vision, an idea, a whisper of timeless good can shape a young person's notion of what's worth living and dying for. The best leaders, teachers, parents, coaches are really artists of encouragement. They're not following a blueprint or a formula. They love life, and they enhance the life that they see in us. For example, a born teacher loving truth or beauty will stir these qualities in the students. Maybe you remember the film The Dead Poet Society, or you've read the book The Joy Luck Club. Here we have two examples of how artists have called others to life, helped them seize the day in the phrase from the Dead Poet Society, and encouraged them, as in the Joy Luck Club, to think well enough of themselves, as with all of the women that were struggling to express something deep and fine and really heroic within themselves. You see how one has to finally and above all come to grips with the fact that there is something valuable within and that something valuable within will not tolerate negation. This is a sacred task to be able to evoke that in another and protect that in ourselves. If I can go back here to talking about Herb Elliot and his coach, Percy Cerruti. I want to recommend a book to you. It's uh, by Larry Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R. It's called Training with Cerruti. 
And he quotes the runner. Meyer was also a runner at Percy Cerruti's training camp. And one of the things that Percy said was that no one is born great. He may be born to become great, but destiny and fate have a miraculous way of working things out to bring tremendous results. And going back to this quality of being that I said was a foundational key to this whole subject, Saruti believed that the fighting spirit that was characteristic of all of his top athletes came directly from himself, in other words, from the coach. He gave regular lectures at his training camp, and he worked individually with each person, and he inspired them to work harder, to seek their potential, to be invincible at something. This comes back again to reaching beyond ourselves. It's pretty self-serving and frankly uninteresting to try to be something only for ourselves. It's actually boring. But if in your striving, you're striving for something larger, like wisdom, like beauty, like service to others, something difficult. Not just money, but something really beyond that, let's say, something universal. Then meaning is simply infused into your life, and there's enormous spiritual power. As we move into this discussion of mentoring and leadership and their connection, in your estimation, is an effective leader equal to the person who's an effective mentor? Are they one and the same, the qualities of effective leadership? Probably not. I mean, there's a relationship, but it's not a mirror subject. For example, a person can be an effective influencer on a wide scale, have a lot of followers, have charisma, be capable of moving people towards a shared value, and be rather what we might call an empty suit when it comes to having an intimate relationship. It's possible that they don't have time for a mentoring relationship. It's possible that they don't have an affinity for us as individuals. Maybe there are too many people dragging at their shirt sleeve saying, help me with this, help me with that. So I have met effective leaders who are not necessarily gifted mentors. But at the same time, the effective leader is going to have some mentor spirit, going to impart something of their archetypal energy to us who are in their sphere so that we get an uplift about what we could do. Is there that difference? I think the mentor, as a person, will guide us towards some kind of reconciliation of our ambitions, conflicts. They'll help us express it. But the effective leader simply expects us to get the job done. It may even be exploitive in some cases. Do you think it's fair to say that part of your recommendation to people in leadership positions is to explore this idea of mentoring and perhaps develop their mentoring abilities? I certainly do recommend to leaders everywhere that they ask themselves, who are they mentoring? Especially for those people that have huge responsibilities. If they don't have an inner circle that they are building the repertoire of skills, usually they don't have a strong organization. When they're not there, the organization isn't as healthy. Let me give you a kind of a novel example of what I mean by deep mentoring. In the early 1800s in France, there was a great emphasis on manners, table manners. And the noblemen and the kings of the court had all kinds of unexpressed opinions about people, how they ought to eat their meal, how they ought to hold their knife and spoon and so forth. And when you were invited to their court, you were expected to know exactly how to behave. So in that sense, there had to be individuals around there. I don't know who they were. I don't know what they were called. But they had to kind of groom the newcomers to the table on how to use their tableware. There was one story about a nobleman who saw an individual in court picking his teeth with a knife, and he banned knives from that point on with sharp points. He only wanted rounded knives. In that sense, we could say mentoring is a very prescribed skill. I'll teach you how to use your knife and fork. And I actually know organizations. I've met people in organizations who want to teach new executives 
how to behave in social settings, let's say. That corresponds. Mm -hmm. And that's one type of mentoring. But that's not what I'm talking about for leaders. For the leaders who have ambitions to shape the thinking, the ideas of their organizations, I think a different kind of mentoring. And it's this relationship that I'm talking about. So you might want to have two levels, two tiers of mentoring or more. One would be for the more mundane cultural effects of the organizations. How do we get along here? How do we do things in this organization or department? At the top level, the top of the house, I would say, to have breakfast meetings where we talk not so much about agenda items, but how do you solve this or that? How do you approach this person? How would I, the leader, handle X, Y, Z? Let me tell you something about myself and my thinking and why I come to this merger with this attitude and rejected that offer. These are the secrets, if you will, of the organization, the wisdom of the organization that will allow that leader to have a much longer reach. I like this idea, Marsha, of the two aspects or levels of mentoring because it seems like there is the one level of teaching people how you want them to perform in a certain task. But when it comes to something more like the vision or the values of a company and the real purpose of the founding of an organization, that seems like a very difficult thing to transmit it to is, somebody. It is difficult. How do, you, how do you mentor people in that? I mean, it seems in, to a certain extent either they're attracted to it and they get it or they don't. Well, I do it by my presence in an organization, and I'll describe to you how I do that. For example, now I go in to the companies that I work with. Usually, it's no longer every month. It's usually on a quarterly basis, and we might have something called a dialogue session again, with that smaller group that wants to go deeper into the philosophy of the founder, a board member, or a panel, and or look at future directions. So it can be applied many different ways. But one thing I found very helpful is if people come to the table knowing that we're going to discuss topic X, and they do a little preparation, and if they can hear the leader expound a little bit on what he th- or she thought about this book, this film. I use films quite a bit. It's amazing in an organization how it livens up the discussion. If people will take a little bit of time, maybe look at two scenes and comment on it. It's coming in on a slant, on an angle, to the very topics that we want to discuss that we're having problems with. You don't say to someone, well, tell us your philosophy. Then they give you the canned speech, the marketing pitch. But if you can come at it on an angle so that you're looking at different slants of the same thing, usually you see a side of that person, you begin to relate to their humanity. It's the humanity of the leader that empowers the others. It's not the blueprint, the marketing statement. This also reminds me of when I've heard family therapists talk about parents and they say it's not what you say, it's what you do in a family. You know, you can say various things about what this family stands for, but if your actions contradict that, that's what children pick up on. That would be the same in an organization. This is so true. You know, we all know organizations, as almost every one of them, they go to these workshops and all of a sudden for the next decade, we're going to have our mission statement laminated on a business card. And every time we're unsure of what to say, we're going to take out our business card and read our mission statement. And then you have individuals that have no depth or breadth of decision making and find it very difficult to embody the principles of that mission statement. And most of the employees in an organization that does that, they'll usually laugh at it. They'll just point to the mission statement and then have a kind of a joke. So it is so that people who are heading up departments in large organizations, organizations that are as large as some communities these days, as cities, must be people who are perceived to walk their talk. And many of them need to talk through their actions so that the audience, it's an audience of constituents, understands why they did this or that. It's not justifying it. It's rather saying, I'm the kind of person that does this and this. Let me give you an example. Very often I have to bring in consultants to work for me. In other words, they're suppliers and they do various things. 
I'm sometimes hard to satisfy because let's say it's a graphic project and I have an eye for art type the layout it's hard for me to satisfy myself so I will say to them in the beginning at the front end let's work together on this but if I'm not satisfied right away I don't want you to be discouraged it's kind of managing the expectations well think about doing that kind of thing at a weekend retreat talking about why and how one comes to certain decisions critical decisions to the organization and how that would pump life into the future decisions so that we're all on the same page making decisions from a, a kind of understood vision each in our own way we're not being little copycats you know we're not mirroring one another but we're kind of empathizing with the founders vision or the board members hope for the organization that's a real dialogue today one of the things that troubles most managers at every level is the decision-making of their employees throughout the organization for example you could have someone in an organization we've seen it happen we've heard about it on the news where they don't particularly like a customer a customer group and they may say something rude their body language may show disdain well this is a nightmare when customers who are now articulate and feel entitled to respectful treatment go to the media and say you know I wasn't respected by this group or that group in this organization and they name it or they file a class action suit it's very expensive well this could be avoided if there had been an ongoing relationship built the infrastructure of the organization relating as a body of people that give and take each other's ideas get used to being polite even when they're tired you see what I mean so there are all kinds of enculturating attitudes that come through the mentoring relationships that cannot come through the blueprint or formula answer